evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fresh Hope Talk Show. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight, so I can hardly wait for you to meet her. Uh, but firstly, we're going to quickly pray, play our traditional. Um, we're going to quickly play our traditional introductory video. Have you seen it, Dr. Carlita? No, I haven't. <laughs> So well, this will be my first time. All right. So this is exciting. <laughs> you'll see. You'll see in just a second. Technology can be um, a real challenge sometimes. Right? So here is the Fresh Hope Talk Show introductor, introduction. Welcome to the Fresh Hope Talk Show a weekly space to encourage conversation about mental health and what's new at Fresh Hope. Tune in each week and interact with us. We promise to keep you good company, inspire you and surprise you. So without further ado, we leave you with our hostess, Samantha Kura. Welcome to the Fre Yay! <laughs> Super. <laughs> so that's our big introduction to make us feel like we're on the Tonight Show or something like that. <laughs> well, everyone, we have Dr. Carla Urrutia de Castillo with me. She's Salvadorian. Um, I can proudly and very gratefully grateful to the Lord say that she is my doctor. And uh, I was so um, honored when she accepted to be here with us in the show. She's one of the best, if not the best, psychologist in the country, I can tell you. And I am very just grateful for her life and grateful to have her here with us. So welcome, Dr. Carlita. Well, Sammy, thank you very much for that um, beautiful introduction. And, and uh, definitely it is an honor for me to be here and be able to share, um, you know, uh, important information that is, you know, um, very pertinent, uh, not only, you know, throughout this pandemic, but also I think that it's something that uh, we all need to know a little bit more about. Yes, definitely. I was reading, uh, somebody shared some news with me that this week, a 16-year-old girl uh, here in El Salvador decided to end her life and it is so sad that uh, you know that this is just getting worse and the more people that are you know aware of this need then the more hope we can give yes definitely so tell us a little bit about well the sub the topic tonight is in general you know just what are the signs of the of alert that you can watch? How can I know if my friend has suicidal ideations or, you know, in general, how can I prevent suicide? Sure, sure, Sammy. When we discuss suicide, I think we must acknowledge that we are not very good at recognizing those who are at risk. That's because it's, you know, it's not an easy task at all. Recognizing those who are at risk is highly, highly complex, and it's a very complicated endeavor for us and for everyone, yes? First, because it's the result of multiple contributing factors, environmental, biological, social, personal. Secondly, because those who are contemplating suicide, they can go unnoticed by others, you know, it's not always something obvious. It's not something that you have written on your face. It's mm -hmm. not something that you can easily observe in someone's appearance. Thirdly, talking about suicide is not part of your day-to-day -day dinner time conversation, right? Yes. Rather, it's usually something frequently we try to avoid. And this is because there's so many taboos um, a negative stigma that surrounds it but but you know in order to be fair we must recognize that at least in the last few years there has this has been changing quite a bit 
I think that this has been achieved largely because the help of mental health awareness campaigns mm -hmm. through social media, uh, the internet, television, talk shows, and even schools. I mean, schools have all this mental health awareness week that they give to the kids and to, to the teachers. And the whole, the whole theme around this, of course, of, of mental health awareness is, you know, promote voicing out concerns, encourage people to speak out about depression, anxiety without feeling, you know, ashamed or guilty about it. Oh, yeah. It's about recognizing symptoms also. And in, in, you know, bottom line, not being afraid of reaching out and seeking help. Yes, so important. Another reason why suicide is highly complex to recognize, it's because not one person is the same. Of course, we all know that. <laughs> Every person has different patterns regarding how they experience emotions. You know, different people um, express depression and anxiety in different forms. Okay. And suicidal thoughts are no different. Yeah, for example, uh, there are people who may battle with suicidal thoughts all day long. Yes, all right. for them, it's a daily struggle. And despite wanting to shake them off, yes, uh, most of them are not able to. For, the, for other people, they have thoughts that come and go. They have at different times, probably during the week or during the months. And still others don't think about it, maybe until they're faced with a triggering event. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so the problem, of course, Sammy, is wanting to simplify suicide. If we want to really understand it, we need to acknowledge all its complexity and understand that nothing is straightforward with suicide. You're right. So when you talk about, you know, what, what can we do about it? To, to know if we should be worried about someone, I think that the first step, if we must understand the different risk factors. And by risk factors, Sammy, we mean those situations internal and external that make a person more vulnerable or prone to having suicide thoughts. And one of the most significant factors is having a mental illness. Okay. Those who suffer from a mental condition or a psychiatric illness are at a higher suicide risk. Individuals with psychiatric disorders are the most vulnerable. These are people who suffer depression, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, personality disorders, alcohol, substance abuse, just to name a few. Yes? Yes. According to an interesting research study that was done for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, with psychological autopsies, they found that 90% of the cases in death by suicide, they all had a potentially treatable underlying psychiatric illness or mental condition that had not been diagnosed or treated. 90%, those, 90% yes. Wow. And those who are listening tonight, it is, it is very important to make it clear that not everyone who suffers from a mental illness dies from suicide, yeah? Yeah. However, those who do suffer from an undiagnosed mental illness, they are at a higher risk of suicide, yes? Youth and teenagers with sexual identity problems are also at higher risk, Sammy. Mm -hmm. This includes <clears throat> um, homosexuals, um, lesbians, transgenders, and if you look at it, the whole LGBT spectrum, yes? The, stati the statistics show that in general, the young heterosexual population are at about a 4% risk for suicide attempt. 
Okay. But if you are an homosexual, that that percentage jumps to an 11 to 20 percent higher risk for suicide attempt. Wow. And for transgender, the risk for suicide attempt jolts to an elevated 30 percent. So the shocking part about this statistic is that most of the youth sexual identity problems, they attempted suicide when they, when, you know, when they do attempt a suicide, they did it before reaching 21 years of age, wow. that young. So suicide risk also rises when there's multiple comorbidity. Okay. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is when the person suffers from more than one mental disorder, that is several psychiatric conditions. For example, a girl who suffers from an eating disorder, let's say anorexia nervosa. Yes. Yeah. That girl is at a higher risk when compared to the general population. But this risk will increase much more when you combine it with other mental conditions. Right. So for example, right. if this girl has, you know, an eating disorder and at the same time is depressed and is taking drugs and is consuming alcohol, okay. she puts herself in a much higher risk for suicide. Yes. So that's yeah. about comorbidity. Yes. Yes, yes. No, another important risk factor is environmental stress. Stressful events, Sammy, places those who are vulnerable to suicide at a higher risk. So individuals with mental illness, or let's say those who are genetically prone to a mental illness that live in high stress environments are at an elevated risk. Now, how does this happen? This happens because cortisol levels in our bodies increase because of living in a high stress environment for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. Now we know that moderately elevated cortisol is a good thing in times of stress, yes? However, yeah. we also know that prolonged and significant elevations of cortisol in the body as the result of ongoing stressful experiences, turns an important protective system into a powerful adverse force capable of causing a broad range of problems at an emotional level, cognitive level, behavioral, physical, the whole, the whole thing. So when the stress, when stress is prolonged and it's chronic, it has an impact in our brain. It starts affecting how we think and how we problem solve. And we all know that life is full of choices and decisions. And when we are under stress, we are all prone to make thinking errors and having distortions in our thinking that may lead to wrong choices and decisions. A person that is at risk then, who is placed in a recurrent stressful environment is susceptible to having altered perceptions and distorted thinking that can lead them to mistakenly access a situation and incorrectly evaluate a potentially dangerous situation as safe. And of oh. course that ultimately can have that person make a life or death decision based on that thinking, yes? So you might be thinking, okay, so what, what are those stressful events? When we talk about stressful events, we can include, you know, chronic illnesses, diabetes, cancer, you know, those, those um, illnesses that they're long, that they are lifelong, yes? Um, yeah. It also includes loss of relationships. Uh, and with that, it means, you know, can be separation, can be a divorce, it can be death, 
you know, a family member dying. Another stressful event is the loss of a job, either, oh. you, you know, being fired or being unemployed. Stressful events can also include social isolation. Oh. And in particular, I want to talk about specifically teens who are, you know, as we speak and for many years submerged in this social media and which are causing you know for them to isolate themselves from the world from their social relationships from being with the family another significant event that places you at a higher risk is having ex being exposed to suicide so people that have directly witnessed in person the event or have had a close family member or a close friend commit suicide these people are at a higher risk Another significant stressor also is trauma. And trauma, uh, there are you know, many kinds, uh, in particular, the one that is associated you know, to longstanding bullying, you know, children's kids that have been, been bullied for many, many years in school, sexual and physical abuse at home, intramarital or spousal violence, that's another one. And a current and ongoing stressor that we all can talk about and that we know is the pandemic. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic, Sammy, has had a profound impact on mental health, particularly on young people between, I don't know, uh, 13 to you know, 21 years old, it has had serious implications, you know, uh, for them. And, you know, as mental health professionals and parents and teachers, we're all responsible for their care and their well-being. And, you yes. know, we need to start thinking about them. Yes. Um, when we talk about COVID pandemic, we are not just referring to this fear of the virus, uh -huh. We're, but also to the levels of social distancing yes. and staying at home that have also served to increase our stress level. Yes, way up. Yes. Uh, being deprived of interactions with others at any age, whether you're five, you're 20, you're 40, 60, 80, is a significant risk factor to develop mental health problems. Um, this is another yeah. pandemic, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, it. You know, it. Yes, <laughs> we, we, we can say it's, it's, it has its tentacles. It's not just the fear of the virus, but everything that has been associated with it. That's right. Yes. yes. And mental health statistics during the first months of the pandemic. That's you know, twenty twenty. It was, you know, showing that there was a possible increase in, you know, uh, young, young people with self-harm, drug abuse, overdose, OCD, mm -hmm. which is obsessive compulsive disorders, depression, of course, anxiety. And, you know, all this have almost, you know, almost doubled in comparison to 2019. So yeah. that's. That's, you know, quite a horrible yeah. yeah. And, and it is believed that the pandemic has also elevated the risk of suicide as people take time to adjust to this new reality. And, you know, the statistics will come out maybe next year or so. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's a big burden, definitely. It's a it's a big burden, and so that's that's in, that's very important because then uh, you know we need to be aware, we need to be conscious, but also we need to know, you know, the warning signs. So to know if we should worry about someone that we know, whether it's a relative, it's a friend, it's a coworker. Yes, there are some of warning signs that we need to watch for. Yes. yes. So 
The most obvious and clear one is, of course, when the person is saying that he or she wants to die. Or mm -hmm. they're telling you about the ways they're looking to take away their life. So if you know of someone that is telling you this, you need to take them seriously. Okay? Yes. In moments of most distress, people who are contemplated suicide might say things such as, I have no purpose in life. I feel hopeless. I feel my life is not getting better. I feel trapped. I feel there's no way out to my situation or my problem. Some of them feel like a huge burden to everyone. Yes, they feel like a burden to their family, to their friends, to society in general. And some of them describe an unbearable and overwhelming emotional pain they cannot get rid of. It stays there for, you know, days, weeks, months. And in, there are other ones that experience or they can experience abrupt mood changes. Um, uh -huh. You can feel sad and then you feel irritable. You can feel angry. So these are some of the things that we might see as warning signs, yes? But yeah. we also might see behavioral warning signs. So, so in other words, um, people might exhibit behavioral changes. And okay. some of those can be, you know, an increase in alcohol consumption, use of drugs. Um, some people might become impulsive, erratic or start displaying chaotic behavior. Um, yeah. Another sign to watch for is aggressive behaviors either towards others or towards themselves. Uh -huh. And these are outward behaviors, but we can also include inward behaviors, internal, right? More inhibitory type of conduct, such as, you know, the person getting more withdrawn, uh -huh. uh, socially isolated, you know, don't want to go out, don't want to talk. They stay at home, they stay in bed. So th this is another type of behavioral changes. And also another warning sign uh, can be exhibited through their thinking. We talked about, you know, distorted thinking. So yeah. they are those people who tend to magnify any stressor in life and they make problems worse than they are. So we have those kinds of people distorting. There are other ones that are the ones that we know them as the catastrophic thinkers that they tend to, you know, take an isolated event and then assume that all future events will be the same. Yes, horrible. And then, of course, there are those who personalized stressors and they blame themselves for everything it's my fault i did this and so they carry everyone's you know uh problems on on top so these are warning signs so once we have these warning signs what do we do if we suspect or we are worried someone is contemplating suicide I mean, what is the best way to handle these kinds of situations? How do we respond, you know, to, to someone that is telling us that he or she wants to die or wants to take away their lives? So, Sammy, the number one rule is if you are worried about somebody, trust your instinct, take it seriously, and ask. And ask, so, okay. And ask, yes. I know this is very hard. It's very uncomfortable for many, but don't be scared to ask. Yes, many of us might be worried approaching or discussing suicide with the person because we automatically think that by doing so, we are placing a thought in their minds, yes? And that that thought will drive them towards feeling suicidal and ultimately acting on it. Yes? 
Yes, exactly. And I, and I think that we all worry about this in some way or the other. However, yeah. we need to understand this is neither true and it's not correct. Actually, the statistic shows that this is totally the opposite. Yes. When we ask and we talk about suicide with the individual, it actually reduces the risk. And it does so because by talking, you are kind of removing that stigma that it's around it. Remember that these are people that probably haven't been able to say, you know, or express their feelings. And so by talking with them, you're opening that window of opportunity for dialogue. Yes. Awesome. Yes. So it is important to know that someone that who has not contemplated suicide will not act on it just because you mention it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And equally, someone who has already contemplated it has already that idea, regardless of you mentioning it. Okay. okay. So it, yeah, it only helps if you talk about it. Yes. Yeah. So actually, you know, talking about it is a way of pre helping prevent it. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and so you have to understand that we can't, you know, live in this fear is that if we talk about suicide you know and and even the word suicide we i don't know if you have noticed but we tend to avoid suicide and we talk about taking our lives away or you know but we we have a hard time even using that word yes there's yeah. that stigma yeah there's yeah stigma. there is okay there is uh, <laughs> okay However, one of the things that, that we must not confuse is that we should not confuse talking to a person in a supportive and empathic manner with the unregulated and morbid exposure that we find in social media regarding suicide. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is not the same, Sammy. And suicide contagion by social media does exist. Uh -huh. So young people who are at risk, when they learn about someone committing suicide in social media, yes? Yeah. They may be at a higher risk of potential suicidal contagion. Okay? Oh, yeah. So be very careful. Yes. Yeah, what, what, what are they watching and what are they consuming in the social media? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's morbid. I mean, I, I don't know if you have, you know, had access, but of course there's some unregulated access uh, that, that, you know, yes. you look at it and it's like, my goodness, is this, this is out there. Yes. And of course, they remove it later on, but it has been exposed for, for you know, a few hours before they take it out. So we yes. need to watch for that. Yes. Um, so what's another thing that we can do? Secondly, yes, is that if you're worried about someone, removing imminent risk is vital. Yes. Uh, okay. This means limiting access to lethal means sammy all right such as access to firearms you know that they can become lethal in the hands of those who are at risk mm -hmm. yes yes so let's say if if any one of us have not reached a crisis situation we can ask you know the person for these weapons so that they can be stored in a safe and inaccessible location to them, okay? Mm -hmm. so that's one way. Of course, if on the other hand, you are or you have reached a crisis situation, the focus is on putting a time between the thought and the action. That means that the time between what the person is thinking on doing and the access they have to acting on it is important. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. It is important to put a safe space between this person and then the means they can use to take their life. So that's the focus. All right. So, so this space can be a can be achieved through a moment of dialogue, a uh -huh. conversation with the person. That's why we're talking about, you know, talk, dialogue conversations providing this space this safe space by talking can help de-escalate that impulsive and irrational moment the person is in and then you know gradually they are more open in receiving help and support sammy we've been saying that um, a person with a mental illness who is under chronic stress is not in the best state of mind to make good decisions. So providing the person with this safe space can help them slowly calm down and hopefully desist from such inflexible ideas and have them at least wait some alternatives and hopefully choose maybe a less lethal means that, of course, can increase their chance of survival. That's the whole point. That's increase. so important. The whole idea is to increase the chance in whatever it's possible. Yes. Yes, yes, Carlita. Yes. You know, and when I hear you talk about the importance of uh, us being able to have a conversation with them or or taking them seriously when they do share something. Yes. And I, I can only uh, also think of people who are listening to us now or will listen to us probably later uh, through YouTube. And maybe they are the person at risk. I mean, maybe they are not watching somebody around them be at risk. Maybe they themselves have been listening to the signs and have said, hey, I might be at risk. So for them, I imagine the advice is the same, right? Look for somebody to talk to. Like, yes, yes. Don't keep, don't keep it to yourself. Just exactly. Um, Someone to talk to. And of course, the whole idea is that either that someone, you know, help look, you know, for some kind of help, treatment, interventions, or for themselves that they're listening to this, go directly and, you know, find a professional, a mental health professional that can listen, knows what to do and help them. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm going to ask you very something very important. Like sometimes people come to me, they have come to me and they share with me uh, some struggles with this kinds of thoughts, uh, but then they expect from me confidentiality. But this is a very delicate point where you cannot promise confidentiality if they're threatening to take their lives, <clears throat> right? Yeah. You have yeah. to. And that applies to all mental health professionals. Yes. Yes. There's a, a breach in confidentiality when there is suspected risk of self-harm. Yes. Or harm to others. Uh -huh. Yes. We, we, we need to, you know, look for ways that that doesn't happen. And so that breach, you know, uh, comes along with it. Yes. So it's really important. You yes, know, it is important. Mm -hmm. we, we have uh, been launching an, a ministry at Fresh Hope, uh, Dr. Carlita, that is called Hope Coaching. And, and it, it drew my attention a lot that you described a person at risk. One of the things you said was some, somebody that's feeling hopeless, trapped, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can't remember the other phrase, but it was something like just stuck in life, right? No purpose, no purpose. Yeah. That's right. So a hope coach is somebody that's not a mental health professional, but it's a bridge 
Yes. And and people who are listening to the show now can can ask to speak to a hope coach at no cost. And if they're struggling with suicidal ideations or feeling hopeless, they I would encourage them to at least ask to talk to, talk to a hope coach. And then all hope coaches are trained to do what you have been telling us to do, like to get them connect them with some help. Yes. And helping them see a way forward. Yes. So what you're saying, know. yes. The first, the first step is to reach out. Yes. And, and that's exactly uh, this, you know, this coaching, this hope coaching that you're describing can be a first step uh, that can lead them, you know, to get, you know, professional help. Because you need, you know, someone that knows what to do and treat them, you know, in the best way possible. Yes. Yeah, they can evaluate if they need further mm -hmm. help or whatever. Yes. So, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. So I, I don't know if you had something else to say, but I, I wanted to kind of share some of the conversations that we can have with someone who is at risk. Oh, you know? please, please do. That's wonderful. Okay, so... Let's say that we have achieved the person, you know, in the sense that they have calmed down, you know, they're more or less open to conversations. Uh, this is, of course, if we are in a crisis situation, but then, of course, we can also talk about someone that it's at work and you see, you know, that person, you know, sad or something. So, you know, the first thing that we do is how can we communicate with someone and try to open that window so that they can receive the help if they need them. Uh -huh. So we know that connecting with the person is very important and it can really make a difference, right? Connections. It is important to remember that those people who are in this state of mind they're not connecting appropriately with reality, okay? These are persons um, that are contemplating suicide. And for example, they might be saying things like, um, you know, I know my family loves me. I know my husband and my kids love me. But I also know that, you know, I am a burden to them with all my problems. I mean, I have money problems, I have social problems. So I think that my family probably will be better off without me. Okay, so these are kind of the things that, you know, some people might be saying. And, and we know that this goes without saying that if their family loves them, they would not be better off without them. Exactly. Um, right. So, so, of course, but these people have you know, these distorted thoughts and this distorted thinking pushes them away from connecting with what's going on with the real world, okay? So by connecting with the individual during our conversation, I think that then we are able to, they are uh, them, they're able to experience this empathy and feel understood and that's so important when they feel this genuine support and yes. interest on our behalf, that can help them guide them and reconnect with what's going on with them. And we can help them open up about their feelings. Yes. And that, yes. you know, they can talk about it. So how do we start a conversation with them like that? Okay. Yeah. So let's say that you have a coworker and you have seen, you know, this person, kind of sad you you can start conversation by saying you know how have you been i mean how's everything you know what i've i've noticed you've been sad lately and more stressed out this past couple of days is there something you know going on uh, if you see that the person starts opening opening a little bit and starts talking you can you know you know, keep asking or saying things, for example, you know what, have you felt so overwhelmed that, you know, keep on going just feels like too much at times? Um, 
I have noticed you've been saying that life has no meaning. I mean, have you thought about not wanting to live anymore? And if, you know, the person is open enough to continue this conversation, you can go even deeper. And then, of course, you know, start approaching the questions more directly and saying, have you been considering suicide? I mean, do you have a plan? How can I help you? How, how can I help you? How can I be available to you? Okay, wow. so these are kind of the things, you know, that you start going with the flow. And according to the conversation, that's how you start asking. By asking this question, Sammy, you obtain answers. Yes? Yes, exactly. So these answers, you're in a better position to know where they are at. You don't have to guess. You know where they are at. You know what their needs are. And when the time comes, then you can provide them with resources so that they can seek help. Now, of course, at the beginning of the conversation, you must avoid jumping straight in and trying to resolve the situation. This is what we usually oh. love to do, right? Let's fix it. Don't. Don't jump. Don't try to resolve. Don't try to dissuade them either. Don't be judgmental. Judging and criticizing can aggravate the feeling of shame and guilt that they have for feeling the way they feel. It can also undermine what they're feeling, yes? And the worst thing that can happen is it, it can close the, the window or the door for further, further dialogue and help, yes? So mm -hmm. you must understand that these individuals are not here by choice. They're, uh -huh. They're not here because it's amusing to them. These are individuals under a great deal of pain and sorrow and in their minds, the only way to stop this pain is by taking their lives away, yes? So it is important to, that we must be very patient and we need to take the time to listen to them first. Oh, I love that, yes. Mm -hmm. We must give them that space for them to speak so that they, they can tell us more. They can tell us their story so that they can explore more. And in that way, they are also de-escalating that momentum. Yes? Yes. And yes. as the conversation flows, we then start looking to minimize the risk by searching with them for other alternatives besides suicide. But one, Sam, one of the important things is that we need to know that we can't remove all the risk in someone's life. We're not their saviors. We cannot remove all this, okay? And there isn't either a risk-free option. Every option carries some form of risk. So we need to understand that just by listening and understanding to their needs, we are already helping them. And yes. that is good enough. Yes? Yes. Just mm -hmm. by showing you care. I just, if I was that coworker that you were talking about a while ago, and you came to me and asked me, how have you been lately? I've noticed you've been a little uh, more stressed or a little sad or just by having you just by knowing you noticed, yes, that would that means so much, you know. Yes. It's about that connection, right? Someone is seeing me, someone is understanding. Yes, uh, someone cares. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, yes. So so by connecting with people, yes, connecting with them, we are in a better position of providing them with suitable resources and support. We know what to do, yes? Yes. Okay, another important thing uh, that during the conversation, it also is important to explore with them different areas of strength. Those are called like protective factors. 
everyone has strengths and weaknesses. So we need to put them on the table also, you know, if, if they're married, if they have a family, a protective factor is their children. Yes. Um, if they're Christians, the faith, hope in God, that's a huge protective factor. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay. And the, the most, okay, so after all this happens, there's one thing that we need to understand. Once a crisis situation like washes over, yes, you mustn't lower your guard. The situation isn't resolved yet. It just kind of has simmered down, okay? Uh-huh. 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 Sometimes that sense of calmness, calmness after the storm is just temporary, okay? So this is why it is so important that we continue supporting and keeping communication open while monitoring the person in order to gradually refer them to a mental health professional for treatment. Okay? Yes. So this, this has several steps, yes? Yes. So it's but- not just about, you know, here I got him, you know, out of the suicidal risk thing and I'm done. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> this it's a whole process. process. Yes. And it's like standing by them for a while, right? Uh, yes. You've done a great job outlining the process. I, I love it. And, and, and thank you. I, I just think that it's really important to understand our role and, and to know how important that connection is. I love that uh, word that you've used, connection. And then to take them to a mental health professional yeah yes. and and that brings us to treatment yes we need treatment it's okay so let's talk about it once the person is open once the person let's say it's willing to receive this help then we can refer them to a mental health professional so that they can receive that appropriate treatment yes now Ideally, the individual shouldn't wait to reach a crisis in order to receive help. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, for many, that is the case. Yes, for many, it is only when the person has been in a crisis that they find out for the first time they're suffering from a mental illness and that they actually need help. Yes. Oh my, that's so right. That well, it happened to me, if you remember. I didn't look for yes. professional help until I was having this very yes. intrusive thoughts and, and just horrible ideas. So yes. you're right. You, you we should ask for help a lot sooner. Yes, and, and this is the reason why it's so important to know the warning signs and the risk factors so that then we can closely monitor ourselves or those you know, that live with us Around that us. have a genetic risk for mental illness. And so by doing so, you know, by monitoring, then we can subsequently treat their illness early. So yeah. it this does not grow and get worse. So mental illness can be treated, especially if we do it early. So yes. in other words, it's important that these individuals are monitored closely so that they can obtain early diagnosis. Yes. By having an early diagnosis, then you can receive early interventions and treatment and yes. you know what Sammy the most important thing that I'm going to say yes receiving timely interventions and treatment can give individuals the opportunity of living a fulfilling life yes. and avoiding a life sentence of problems and crisis yes, yes. So you're not stuck, right, to living a life of problems. Now, 
the longer you live with an untreated mental illness, the harder it is to overcome it. And I think that this is with everything, right? Yes. So the earlier you catch it, the easier it is to treat. Exactly. I love that. And I love the hope in your words that, you know, with, with treatment, it is very possible to live a fulfilled yes. life. Yes. Treat, treatment actually can help, uh, Sami. And I will conclude with this. Combination of therapy and medication as treatment has been proven to help change the way the brain functions. And it has also proven to provide a person with a better quality of life. Yes. So yes. it does help. And so let's be active on prevention. Yes. yes. Let's do it before we get to a crisis. And how do we do this? If I'm, I'm just going to leave you with a few tips that we've talked about. If we're going to be active on prevention, prevention starts with putting our own mental health first. Yes, that starts first. Mental Love health that. first, okay? Two, recognizing and knowing your risk factors and warning signs. And we talked a, a few of them. There are many yes. more, okay? Yes. Monitor closely yourself or family members that have a genetic predisposition for mental disorders. Look for the signs and treat early so it doesn't aggravate, okay? Yes. So if in the family, there's a psychiatric family history of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, then you monitor people closely for those kind of mental disorders. Yeah. Don't wait for the thing, you know, surprises you. The other one, reduce environmental stressors. We know that chronic, chronic stressors with, you know, risk or, or, or vulnerability, the two mm -hmm. together, you know, are not, are not positive uh, factors, uh -huh. okay? And then the last one will be, do not isolate yourself. Yes. Have a strong social support network, very important. Mm -hmm. I love it, Dr. Carlita, thank you so much. This has been so valuable for everybody. If you, if you didn't see this completely, it's going to be on YouTube uh, later on this week on the Fresh Hope uh, Network channel. And you can contact Car Dr. Carlita by contacting me. Uh, she, she, she has been a great instrument in the Lord's hands for my life. And I know for, ev for a lot of people's lives, not only mine, but I say mine because I know me. <laughs> but anyways, I'm really grateful for your time, Dr. Carlita. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll, we'll stay in touch. Great. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope um, that this can be helpful for many people. That's, that's the whole idea. Thank you I for sure. bringing all this awareness, Amy. I'm sure it's going to be helpful. I'm praying that day that we receive some uh, feedback and people asking for help so that we can support them. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.